This is FRM Part 1, Book 1, Foundations of Risk Management, and this is Chapter 10, the Capital Asset Pricing Model. One of the great advances by uh, the founders of modern portfolio theory, and this was developed back in 1964, and remember that this was really the early days of the discipline of finance, so this was cutting edge. Uh, with what seemed like a long, long time ago. Let's look at some learning objectives for this chapter. Understand the derivation and the components of CAPM. Describe the assumptions. Interpret the capital market line. Apply CAPM in calculating an expected return, and then interpret and calculate beta. So we'll do all those over the next 15 or so slides. Uh, let's start with uh, some of the underlying assumptions in the capital asset pricing model. And this was developed by William Sharp and John Lintner and Jan Mawson back in the early 1960s. And although these three men arrived at this derivation separately, each of them thought to answer the following question. And remember that there really was no discipline of finance back then. And so there were, there were all uh, economists who were trying to take what they know from macro and microeconomics and apply it to the stock market to try to figure out what is a reasonable rate of return. And so this is what these three guys did. They said, all right, look, what can I reasonably expect to get out of an investment in a share of stock, like Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson or McDonald's or IBM back in those days. And this is what these three guys said. They said, look, what we need to start with is the risk-free rate of interest because nobody is going to invest in Johnson & Johnson stock if he or she expects to earn something less than the risk-free rate of return. So in this capital asset pricing model formula, you start with the risk-free rate of interest. So notice on the left-hand side, that's the expected return on an individual stock, or if approaching it from the corporation's or the business's perspective, it's called the cost of equity. Starts with the risk-free rate of interest, and then it adds something. So notice there's the R sub F plus, and that plus thing there on the right-hand side of the plus sign that is what won William Sharp the Nobel Prize in economics um, for this work. And let's, let's forget about the, the beta there for a second. This is what else that these three guys said. They said, all right, what we reasonably expect to get out of Johnson & Johnson has to depend on what's going on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So that R sub M, that's the expected return on the market portfolio. Oh, wow. This is what we learned from Harry Markowitz back in the 1950s, that what individuals in, will, will tend to do is they will tend to hold the market portfolio because it's a well-diversified portfolio. And I have a slide in just a few minutes that's going to illustrate how that diversification reduces risk. But what Sharp, Lintner, and Mawson decided was that what you get out of one individual stock depends on what's going on on in the entire market, but not what's going on in the entire market as an absolute term, but how much that exceeds the risk-free rate. That's why the RM minus the RF is in parentheses. That's called the equity risk premium. So just think about this. If you can get 3%, 3% out of taking no risk by investing in a risk-free security like a treasury bill, and you can get 10% out of the floor of the New York Stock Exchange by owning a well-diversified portfolio, then you can generate a 7% extra risk. We call that an equity risk premium. You get 7% more than what you get out of a treasury bill or a treasury bond. So think about what these three guys are saying now. It depends on what's going on in the risk-free credit market, and then it depends on what's going on on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange in relation to the risk-free credit market. And then that quantity is weighted by the beta of that individual stock. We're going to talk about beta throughout this slide deck, but for now, I want you to think of beta as the measure of the relevant and appropriate measure of systematic risk. 
So what do we have in that formula? We have that the expected return on any individual stock is begins with the risk-free rate, and then it adds a little bit of flavor of a well-diversified portfolio, and then it's weighted by the beta of a stock. What do we know? Notice on the graph there, I have on the horizontal axis, there's a beta of 1.0. That's a critical point. The market portfolio, a well-diversified portfolio, has a beta of 1.0. That's by definition. So the beta of an individual stock can be anywhere between 0 and 2, although that's kind of a standard uh, vice to, to standardize that random variable. But betas can be negative and they can be greater than 2, depending on the time period under which it is measured. But in general, people think of beta as being between 0 and 2. So a beta above, uh, above 1 has more systematic risk than on average, and a beta below 1 has a level of systematic risk that is less than the average risk in the equity markets. All right, notice on the vertical axis, I have the expected return on an individual stock, sub i, and I place on the vertical axis two points, the risk-free rate of interest, which is the intercepting point, and then the expected return on the market portfolio, which has a beta of 1.0. So if you draw a line, from the risk-free rate of interest through the star all the way up to that right-hand quadrant, you get something that's known as the security market line. And the security market line is really nothing more than a picture of the capital asset pricing model. Now, what lots of financial analysts try to do is identify over and undervalued stocks in relation to this security market line. And this is what we know, that given a set of underlying assumptions that every stock should fall directly on that security market line, if the markets are informationally efficient, and if all investors have the same information set, plus a bunch of other assumptions that we'll talk about here in just a minute. But that security market line, I want you to think about it in the following terms. Think of it as the equilibrium point of supply and demand for all stocks. Now here's a list of these good assumptions. You're not going to like any of them. There are no transaction costs. There are no taxes. Assets are infinitely divisible. That means you could buy an eighth or a sixteenth or, or three seventy seconds of a share of stock. Short selling is unlimited. All assets are both marketable and liquid. Um, investors really have no influence over price, so we say that they are price takers. Um, and the investor's utility function are based solely on two things, the expected portfolio return and risk. And then originally this was meant as a single period model, but a lot of adjustments have shown that you can extend it into an intertemporal capital asset pricing model. Now, here's the thing. I said that you're not going to like these because, of course, there are transaction costs. Of course, there are taxes. You can't buy one eighth of a share of stock, et cetera, et cetera. But here's how I want you to view these assumptions. And I want you to focus on the contribution. What these three men have done is they have stripped away these things that are kind of extraneous to what investors can expect to receive on investing in an individual stock. And it allows us to focus on the important parts. And let me just skip back here. What are those important parts? Risk-free return, market return, and the level of systematic risk. These are the really critical components of an investor's expected return. Let's go ahead and interpret beta. This is a beautiful picture here that I have at the bottom. Notice that on the horizontal axis, I have number of assets, could be number of stocks in the portfolio. And then on the vertical axis, I have portfolio risk. Think of that as standard deviation. Remember, standard deviation is a measure of total variability. Inside of investments, we think of it as the total variability in stock returns. Total variability, meaning it's total. There's nothing else out there. It is total. And by the way, standard deviation is measured as a risk in lots of other fields, like 
like engineering and in science and in medicine. So it's not like it's not like financial risk managers have a monopoly on the use of standard deviation. It's used by lots and lots of other professionals out there. All right, let me go through the bullet points here quickly. Uh, beta is a measure of systematic risk. So are you ready for this? Systematic risk, I want you to think of it as the variability in stock returns due to changes in economic factors. Things like inflation and interest rates and oil prices and uh, GNP and wars and presidential elections and anything that you learn back in your macroeconomic class tells us that beta captures the risk of those macroeconomic factors. Okay, a beta of more than one indicates that an asset is going to have a greater return than the market portfolio. A beta close to zero means that uh, there's no relationship, and I'll show you what that means here in just a second mathematically. And then remember I said just a few minutes ago that you, you can have negative betas, but it's probably over some shorter time period. But it could be a signal that the performance is counter cyclical. This is interesting for those investors who are contrarian investors who go who go against the grain or against the market. All right, I want to get back to this picture here. Now, are you ready for this? So look at uh, the very top where that red curve crosses over the vertical axis. That would be the average portfolio risk or the average standard deviation of investing in just one stock. And I wonder if you guys know that there have been tons and tons of studies done on this. The average standard deviation, if you just threw a dart at a board and invested randomly in an individual stock, the average standard deviation is about 50%. Oh my gosh, what, is, what does that mean? That means that on average, you're going to be 50% wrong. That's why if any of you guys hit the Powerball lottery this week for $400 million, you're not going to, well, pay taxes and then buy houses and cars and for all your family members and all that stuff. And you're still going to have $200 million left over. You're not going to invest $200 million in even the greatest stocks of all time, like like a Johnson & Johnson or Amazon. Why? Because it's too risky. You're going to diversify your portfolio. That's why that red curve is downward sloping. So as we add the second and the third and the 10th and the 20th and the 50th, that is downward sloping. And that's called unsystematic risk or specific risk that is eliminated by diversification. All right, you ready for this? A definition of unsystematic risk or specific risk, some call it idiosyncratic risk, is the variability in stock returns due to changes in firm specific factors. So you can eliminate, in fact, in the academic world, we say unsystematic risk is virtually eliminated through this concept of diversification. But note, as we get out to the right side there, when we go to 80 or 90 or 100, that downward slope flattens. And sooner or later, it becomes parallel to the horizontal axis. So that beyond a certain number of assets in the portfolio, there are no benefits to diversification. So what is that bottom, that bottom dotted line? Notice I have it, undiversifiable market risk. This is systematic risk. And this is what investors get to do. They get to pick the height of that first dotted line. If investors like lots and lots of systematic risk, they can pick high beta stocks, stocks that have a beta of 1.8 or 1.9. If they don't like much systematic risk, they can pick low beta stocks, 0.2 or 0.3 or 0.4. Here's the cool thing. This is the interpretation of beta. Beta measures variability. If you like lots of variability, pick high beta stocks. If you like low variability, pick low beta stocks. But here's the important part of that. Whether you're a high beta person or a low beta person, you're going to move all the way out to the right hand side of this picture so that you have a well diversified portfolio and that you have eliminated unsystematic risk because and here's the punchline. Nobody gets compensated for taking unsystematic risk. Now, here's a couple of good formulas for beta. It's equal to the 
covariance between the individual stock and the market portfolio. There's that lowercase sigma and then sub I M. I is for the individual stock, M is for the market portfolio. And that's all divided by the variance or the standard deviation squared of the market portfolio. Now you can substitute the correlation coefficient. That's what I've done in that second formula. There's like the sideways P that's called the letter rho. And so we're going to take the correlation coefficient between the individual stock and the market portfolio times the ratio of the standard deviation of the individual stock divided by the standard deviation of the market portfolio. So you can compute beta in either of those two equations. But notice, we're dividing either by the variance, which is standard deviation squared, or by the standard deviation, both cases of the market portfolio. And this is what econometricians do all the time. When they have random variables that can take on almost any value, they don't like that because it's tough to interpret something that is a minus six million. So what statisticians and econometricians do is they get their vice out and they squeeze and they squeeze and they squeeze and they make that random variable standardized by dividing by some measure of risk. So really this beta is a standardized random variable and it's gonna be between, oh, dare I say this, zero and two. Don't tell any of my college professors that I said that it's between zero and two. That's kind of the convention that all betas must fall between zero and two, but, but they don't. They can be negative, as I said before, and they can be a little bit more than two. Let me just take a pause. When I was writing my dissertation, I calculated the beta for about 2,000 stocks, and I think I had six or seven of them that were negative and probably 20 or 30 of them that were greater than two. Let's take a quick example. How do you calculate this, uh, this expected return? So let's take some input variables here. Risk-free rate is 5%. Standard deviation of our individual security, 40%. Standard deviation of the market portfolio is 20%. And the correlation with between the individual security and the market portfolio is 0.8. And remember, what does that correlation coefficient tell us? If the correlation coefficient is 1, 1 1.0, that means when the one stock does this, the other stock does the exact same thing. They perfectly mirror each other. So in this case, and, and let's not tell any of our econometrics professors that I'm going to say this, that a correlation coefficient of 0.8, it kind of means, but I think this is a good way to visualize it, it means that if one stock goes up by 10%, then the other stock is going to go up by 8%. Now, it's kind of going to, not going to do that every day, but maybe over an extended time period. That's one way to interpret the correlation coefficient. And then the return on the market portfolio is 10%. And by the way, that 40% and the 20% is uh, relatively uh, realistic because going back here, let me go back to my uh, my formula. Remember, I'm sorry, my, my graph. Remember I said to you that the average standard deviation of investing in one stock is 50%. But if you have a well-diversified portfolio, that average standard deviation of like the S&P 500 index or some comparable well-diversified portfolio is maybe 15 or 17 or 18 percent. So just by diversifying, you can eliminate, you know, well over half the risk that's out there. All right, so let's go ahead and get the formula out here. Let's first find the beta, multiply that correlation coefficient by the ratio of the individual standard deviation divided by the market portfolio standard deviation. That gives us a beta of 1.6. So what does that mean? That means that our beta is 1.6. It means that we're about 60% more variable than the market portfolio. So we use that 1.6 as an input and we get an expected return of 13%. And by the way, boy, if you ever get to this on an exam, don't make the mistake of violating the distributive property of mathematics. Always do inside the brackets first. I think we can do this. Uh, I think we can do this fairly, uh, fairly with a reasonable sense of what numbers mean. Let's do the 10, the 10 minus five. That gives us 5%, right? Multiply that by 1.6, that's going to get us up to, oh, around 8, right? So yeah, that's 8. And then add the 5, that gets us the 13. If you do this in your calculator, if you do 5 plus 1.6 times 10 minus 5, you're going to get some crazy answer. So start with in, the inside of the brackets. 
How about the derivation? This was one of those. Uh, this was one of those learning objectives. So here's the thing. I said this earlier. Recognize that investors are only compensated for bearing systematic risk, picking picking the height of that lower dotted line. They're not compensated for specific risks that can easily be diversified away. So beta is the appropriate measure of risk. And then recognize that the portfolio expected return is really just a weighted average of the individual returns and the portfolio beta is a weighted average of the individual betas, which means, which means that we can show that the relationship between risk, in this case beta, and expected return is linear. Oh boy, this is amazing. This is something that comes out of the Harry Markowitz Efficient Frontier that he developed back in 1952, in which the relationship was nonlinear based on a different set of assumptions. But now in this capital asset pricing model, we know that the relationship is linear. And what we do then is we, uh, we equate the slope of the line with the slope of the Harry Markowitz Efficient Frontier, and we get the capital asset pricing model and that equation there at the bottom. Now that brings us to the capital market line, which was directly produced by Harry Markowitz's Efficient Frontier. Um, this is also a linear relationship, but notice, and I put the risk measures out on the far right. Let me do this again. If I go back here, notice that systematic risk is before the parentheses. Now with the capital market line, what we're doing is we're measuring risk as the ratio of the two standard deviations. So I put it out there on the far right so that you can see it. The capital market line and the security market line, which is the capital asset pricing model, are virtually identical with the exception of how each measures risk. Capital market line measures risk in terms of the ratio of standard deviations, which I told you earlier is total risk. Security market line and the capital asset pricing model uses beta, which is a measure of systematic risk. And so the capital market line, it's called a line, right? So it is linear, the linear relationship between notice standard deviation on the horizontal axis and the return on a portfolio on the vertical axis. And so the capital market line really is just a measure of where does an investor pick to place themselves in terms of the trade-off between risk and return. Notice the starred point there at the end. That's the market portfolio. And this is what we know. We know that all investors are going to own the market portfolio. And then they can move either downward to the left on the capital market line or upwards and to the right on the capital market line. This is called the Fisher separation theorem. And so if an investor combines the market portfolio with a treasury bond, he's going to invest in the lending portfolio. Lending is to the left of M. And notice I picked 75 and 50%. And if you have 0% invested in the market portfolio, that must mean you have 100% invested in the treasury bond or some risk-free asset. And your return in this case is going to be 10%. So think of, think of between the star and the intercept of the vertical axis as the placement of investors who are combining treasury bills with the S&P 500 index. I mean, that's kind of a loose interpretation. But what about those investors who want to get more than the market portfolio return? How can they move upwards and to the right? Well, this is called the borrowing portfolio. And the only way you can get up there is to use leverage like Oh boy, never do this. Take out a home equity loan and invest in shares of stock. Hopefully you will never do that, but that would be leverage, an example of leverage. Simple way is just to use margin accounts, maybe just put up $6,000 and borrow $4,000 to invest in a $10,000 portfolio. Or even better yet, how about using futures contracts or swap contracts or option contracts? So the use of any of these derivative securities involves leverage, and so you can get out to that upper right-hand corner. Think about the capital market line as the efficient frontier. This is the goal of every investor, is to locate him or herself directly on that capital market line, because anything below it is inefficient. Anything above it is unattainable, so you can't, you can't get up there. All right, how about a quick example about uh, matching this Fisher separation, which I was talking about a minute ago. 
Suppose we have 130% of our portfolio invested in the risky asset, which must mean that we're shorting something. So there's a risk-free return of three, market portfolio return of 10, standard deviation of the market portfolio of 26. I'm not sure we're gonna need that thing. So here, what we're doing is we're borrowing 30% in the risk-free asset and investing the proceeds in the market portfolio. So the return is just a weighted average. So we have minus 30 times the 3% and then 130 times the 10%, that gets us to 12.1%. And I think that takes us through chapter 10, capital asset pricing model. Yeah, we talked about derivation. We did the assumptions. We did the CML, yep. And we talked about beta. Next, we're gonna apply it to things like the Sharpe ratio. There's, there's William Sharp again.